Hello, Franklin. This is Malik Lyons, Tap Into Editor, speaking with some uh, Franklin Township Police Director, Ms. Mayweather. Ms. Mayweather, can you um, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you've done um, uh, or about your journey to get here to Franklin Township? All right. Good morning. So hello, everyone. My name is Quivella Mayweather. I am a graduate of New Jersey Institute of Technology. I also attended Seton Hall University with, um, I obtained my master's degree. And early on in my, uh, I'm gonna say career, I started with the city of Newark when I was about 16. Because a lot of people say, how did you get here so fast? You know, you're so young. But I started working when I was 16, uh, $5 an hour in City Hall as a student assistant after school, that's all it took, just persistence. And, you know, I worked uh, for the city of Newark, then I went to the Essex County Prosecutor's Office, where I worked my way through the ranks and I became uh, actually the first person to work their way through the ranks to become chief of detectives. And I was the first African-American uh, female chief of detectives in the state of New Jersey, and definitely the first one in Essex County. I retired in 2018, and then in 2020, during the COVID pandemic, I came to Franklin as the public safety director. So I'm here now, almost two years. Uh, my anniversary is coming up soon, and you know it's been a great experience. I can say, you know, everyone has, you know, welcomed me, uh, take, taken the time to come out, meet me where we could. I mean, during COVID, it was a little difficult, but you know, doing our Tuesday night talks and our other events. It's been, it's been great. And I'm also now a Franklin Township resident. Thank you, thank you. And that was very interesting. Um, when you started your tenure here, it was right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, that's a very unique situation. With that said, do you have a perspective? Like how, how do you think um, the pandemic has impacted policing or if it has impacted policing? Mm -hmm. So I think definitely um, it made law enforcement and the community take a step back because one, we didn't have that. We wanted to minimize that face-to-face -face contact to protect the officers and to protect our residents and the citizens that we come in contact with. Um, we had to go to single um, officer cars where in some zones we were two officers in a car. We had to make it single officers. They still respond together but they ride in the cars alone. So I think what made it really tough was me trying to you know, implement our community policing and our community relations bureau, because we had to find other creative ways to interact with the community. You know, That's why we did like the food drives where there could be a drive-by food drive. And I'm sure you remember when we did all of those um, parades <laughs> with the police and fire, so, you know, we had to get creative during COVID. I think, you know, it's not easy trying to, you know, implement things, but here's the thing. We still had to do our job at the end of the day. And I'm very proud of the men and women in, in the department because they never complained. They never came out and said, well, it's COVID. I'm not doing that. You know, they still went in, took care of what they had to take care of, you know, responding to calls, no matter what it was. I think their instincts kicked in first, and the thought of COVID came later, usually later that day or later a couple of days when they might not have felt so well. So, oh, wait a minute. And you know, the great part that I found, uh, Mr. Lyons, was that a lot of our citizens were kind enough that if they found out, you know, a couple of days later that they were, um, you know, COVID positive, they would reach back out to the department and tell us. So we were able to test our officers and prevent the spread. So that was awesome. So. You know, I think COVID, a lot of people complain about, you know, what we had to do during this pandemic, but I saw another side of, you know, the community also, because they definitely worked with us in um, terms of that. That's fantastic. And one of the things um, that you mentioned was the Community Rate Relations Bureau. That started right at the <laughs> start of the pandemic as well. And I've seen a lot of programs coming out of the Relations Bureau. Can you um, talk a little bit about that? Like some of the goals for the future for the rest of the year and-, and So it, it's funny you say that. So during COVID, 
um, Captain Heaven, uh, Sean Heaven, he's one of the captains in the department. He came to me, you know, director, what do you think we can do? And, you know, it's always dicey dealing with COVID. So you don't want to um, put anyone at risk, you know, not the officers, not our citizens that are participating. So what we did was he came to me with, um, like we had the Citizen Academy, which is still going on. We do it virtually. Um, some of the activities that the participants were able to come in for in small groups, um, you know, we switch, that should be a live class because you take them on tours of the police department and things like that. And, you know, we've done some tours. We've kind of sped through the police department to show them what's what, but um, we kept that going. Franklin Fit, uh, that became also one of our programs. And we said, well, it's outside because we started it when the weather was nice. So we were able to continue that until it started getting dark too early and started getting too chilly. And then luckily, you know, our youth center, we were able to use that because it's a bigger space and it's open and the numbers were down. So we, we adjust. Um, we're coming up with another program, Franklin Cops um, and the Autism Community Networking Event. So what network, what we have is, you know, you can register for a tour of the police department or our community relations bureau and the purpose of that is we know that we have youth and you know young adults in the autism community that you know are confused about policing you know and we want our officers also to be familiar with them as well so that networking you know it helps um, both ways uh, we working with one of our residents, and I'm sorry, she's, if she's listening, I can't remember her name right now, to come up with, she has a, like a bumper sticker, so that first responders know that there's someone that may be in that vehicle that has autism. So if something happens to the parent, or if the child or young adult is driving, and they're not responding in a, you know, way that, you know, the officer or the EMS worker or, or might not expect they see that bumper sticker and recognize, oh, okay, this might be that type of situation and know how to adjust. So we're doing that. We also have partnered with PNC Bank um, in town. They actually helped paint our uh, breast cancer car. I don't know if you um, have seen that out and about. I think she's cute. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? I was I was there for the unveiling at the uh, church. <laughs> okay, and one of the things we changed up, we used to have, um, so a couple of times the county paid for us to get our car wrapped. And that wasn't the best experience because we had some paint peeling issues and things like that. So we decided this year partnering with PNC, you know what, why don't we just get the car wrapped and leave it? You know, I understand breast cancer awareness month is one month a year, but listen, it's happening all months in the year. And we want to have that vehicle available all the time. So, you know, we protect it. We put a cover on it when we're not using it, but um, we have that. We also partner with Amazon. Amazon has been great. I don't know if you saw the um, sweepstakes we had for the college students, giving them things to take back to college, wow. um, even like during our toy drives, um, working with like the local churches and um, community Baptists, and of course, First Baptist and Dr. Anna Pilatus, um, with the, I mean, we've set up toy drive pickups all over. Uh, Franklin for anyone who wants to do it. Um, and we pick up the toys and we distribute them because a lot of businesses say, you know, we want to do this, but we don't know how to distribute distribute them. So we have kind of become the hub for that. Also, uh, Franklin Food Bank, you know, we used to try to buy our own food trucks and deliver, you know, give out food at CRB and Franklin Food Bank. They've been great. We do it every month. Uh, we partner with them. It's great to see our officers out there, you know, do, giving back to the community. But I am proud of the fact that when we didn't have that partnership going right away, that our officers would step up and donate uh, their own money so that we could do that uh, a couple times last year. So Community Relations Bureau, I mean, I could go on and on and on. We have My Brother's Keeper. The, one of the biggest things that I wanted to bring out and I wanted to make sure that everyone's aware of, we are starting our station house adjustment program. And um, I was kind of surprised when I came here that Franklin did not already have one, but 
listen, it provides mentoring and guidance for our juveniles and the parents. And the station house adjustment, it kind of removes the juvenile from the scenario of being in the system so early. Like you try to do preventive things before it comes to that point, if you can. And, you know, youth that are heading down the wrong path, I think sometimes that one experience helps. You know, it helps them recognize that this isn't what I want to do. This isn't what I want to get involved with. And, and that's the objective of that, to prevent, you know, further activities, you know, by the young person. And I think if the officers and the parents are involved, it, it, it's tremendous. I've seen it in Essex County. I've seen it, you know, in smaller communities. Sometimes all you need is that one intervention. And that's what the Station House Adjustment Program is. Wow, that's a that sounds like a very interesting program. It's like a, like they say, like an ounce of uh, prevention, you know, is worth that pound of cure, right there, right? Um, and that, and that, that's a great thing. Um, one one other thing I was uh, wondering about you when you were speaking about the Community Relations Bureau, um, I, I, I see and I hear a lot of programs kind of interacting with the public. One such program that I think um, a lot of people in the public may not be aware of, another program that you have. Um, yeah, or like, I don't know a lot about it. Um, Deputy Mayor Pruitt mentioned it last week. It was sort of like a survey of some type that um, some people can, can take. Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit? So what she was speaking of, um, Deputy Mayor Pruitt, we discussed, it's called QHIT. It's a survey. It's kind of, it's outside of the Community Relations Bureau, but mm, okay. it's related. What happens is starting next month, after you interact with the police, we're not gonna do it that day. You're not gonna get it that night because we know, listen, it's like by the time if you're involved in an incident, police have been to your home or you've you know interacted with the police, you might not wanna do it right then and there. So a couple of days later, you'll receive, and they'll explain this to you. You'll receive an email or a text, which leads you to the survey where you actually rate what your interaction was with the police. I don't know if you've had furniture delivered recently or any type of delivery. You know, as soon as they leave, they sit, text you a survey and they wanna hear feedback. And that's what I want. I want feedback. I want feedback from the community about how was your service with the police officers? Because what we're expecting is everyone to give the same service that, you know, we expect and that the residents deserve. Let's face it, it policing is not what it used to be. It's not, it really isn't. Very interesting program. And and speaking of different programs that are launching um, sometime next month, uh, it was also announced at last week's um, council meeting um, that there will be body cams for the uh, police department. Can you discuss that a little bit, please? So um, as you may know, the attorney general mandated that law enforcement have been, um, body cams in 2022. So we talked about things that have impacted COVID. Obviously, that's one of them. Um, believe it or not, we had we had vendors in our department come. I guess they were coming from Arizona. I, I can't remember what state it was, but they came to our department and they wind up being COVID positive, which exposed some of our officers that were with them. So you know, we kept hitting roadblocks in terms of different things and doing this. But with New Jersey being the state that said everyone has to have body cams. You could see the type of um, demand that it put on these companies as well. So mm. we finally um, started our training January 24th. That's when we were on the calendar with the um, body cam company. And right now we are in a testing phase. Uh, we have officers who are wearing the body cams and we anticipate uh, in about two weeks, everyone will have the body cams on. Um, we just want to make sure they've had the classroom training, we want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to kind of get a test run through on a day just to make sure they know how to operate them because we don't want anyone to say, well, I wasn't sure, I wasn't this. We just want to make sure that our officers have a fair chance to learn how to use the technology. It's not hard, but you know how things are. It's not the equipment itself turning on off. It's the matter of when must they turn it on and off and how 
you know, you know, if a citizen says, I don't want to be recorded, whether or not they have to turn it on and off. So it's, so it's some decision making. So it's kind of like firearm simulator training. You know, it's, you know, you get a practical experience with it doing that. You can't do that with the body cam. So we just kind of have to have, we don't have a simulator. So we have to put it on the officers and let them have a chance to um, test them out during their shifts. So I think it's going to be great. Um, listen, one of the things about the cameras video does not lie. I think we all act better on video. <laughs> like right <Very> now, true. <laughs> all right, right now I'm not going to eat my breakfast because I'm on video. <laughs> <laughs> very true. Very true. <laughs> Don't want to be caught chewing or picking your teeth. So, but it is, I think, you know, for the community and for the officers, everyone acts better. We always did have video, um, on the cars, but as you know, if you park the car and you have to go inside somewhere then the officer is basically just um, working off the audio. So the cameras help. So we always had something, but this just enhances it. Yeah, the audio is really rough. I just saw a recent audio video, like dashboard cam video, and it was really rough to, to see stuff. Um, or yeah, you couldn't see anything. Um, quick, quick um, la one of my last questions, uh, how has, um, how do like local ordinances that are different or local laws, differ from neighboring towns impact policing. For example, uh, like most recently we, we had uh, like a mask mandate um, and other towns nearby didn't have that. And, and I know moving forward, once um, things are more finalized in the community, uh, cannabis laws will be different from town to town. How does that um, impact or if it even does impact um, policing? So let me say this, in terms of cannabis, I mean, definitely the laws are the same throughout New Jersey, but some townships are opting out of letting it be sold recreationally in their towns. That doesn't really impact us that much. Um, you know, if it's sold rec if it's sold here and it's approved, it's sold here. Um, it's, that's pretty clear. Uh, if they don't sell it next door in the next town, you know, uh, it's like not having a liquor store in another town. We have one, they don't. In terms of the mask, I mean, it gets confusing, I guess, for residents, especially, you know, if you um, shop locally and you go into one town and there's no mask mandate, you go into the next town, oh, wait, I need a mask here. Um, so it does get confusing and we try to make sure everyone knows about it. I don't know if everyone gets Nixle alerts, it's N-I-X-L-E. That helps because Nixle alerts, they'll send you a text, they'll send you an email, depending on how you sign up for it. And it's just a reminder. Um, I even get the Nixle alerts because you know you need that reminder of what's going on. I don't know if every citizen is able to watch every single council meeting to its entirety. You know, I don't know if you have a chance. Let me go check on the website to see what's new this week. But you know, we did post it on the website. We did send out Nixle alerts. Um, you know, you just have to stay informed. And if you don't get those alerts, if you don't go on a website, I think it's worth a shot. Um, Franklin Township did update the website. We're still, you know, in the works right now, but it is up and live. It looks great. Um, I like it compared to the old one. When I first came here, I was like, okay, we can use a new website. And before I knew it, we were getting a new website. Um, not just because I thought of it, but <laughs> it was just one of those things you see it and IT was already on it. So but I think that's how you make sure you stay informed, get the next alerts, go to the website, check out what's new. Great, great. It's, and um, one, one final question, uh, since you have a ton of experience in, in, in policing, obviously from different communities, uh, what, what do you see right now as the biggest threat to the public safety? Um, and, and how can a regular citizen get involved to help mitigate these threats threat or so, threats I, I will say and everyone will probably say wait for you to say you know oh gun violence this that but you know thankfully you know it's not that type of you know threat here in Franklin I mean things can happen anywhere trust me we're prepared for anything we don't just sit back and say it can't happen here but for us, one of the biggest threats is social media. You know, a lot of our crimes emanate from social media, from kids 
um, learning and doing and, you know, repeating things that they see on TikTok or Facebook or Instagram, um, you know, trust me, we've had thefts, you know, where people try to sell things through social media, um, they're robbed, you know, we have a safe space right in front of the police department. If you want a safe exchange, you want to sell something, meet them in front of the police department. Do not give anyone your address because if they don't rob you, then they may come back and rob you later. Um, you know, it, it's really serious. Also, you know, social media, it makes, it makes everything harder because think about it. You send money through the computer. Someone contacts you through messenger and you, you get robbed that way. Most times they're not in this state. They might not even be in this country. So it makes our job harder in trying to identify who the suspect is. So I'm social media in terms of our young people, um, you know, most of the threats that we've had through the schools came through social media. Uh, so a lot of time and money is spent investigating crimes that kind of emanate from social media. And then the other one, I'm gonna say it, lock your doors. I know it gets very, very, very hard. Um, you know, I have two teenagers and listen, I know I'm quite different, <laughs> very different based upon what I do and what I hear and what I see. But I have alerts on my phone where if my car door isn't locked after 30 minutes, it sends me an alert. If my house door isn't locked after 15 minutes, it sends me an alert. I mean, I, I can lock and start anything from my phone, but I think I might be over the top. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, but seriously though, you have to lock your doors. You have to make sure your car doors are locked. We all get caught up, but you know, you leave your car door open. Listen, I considered taking my garage door opener out of my car. Cause I'm like, if they break my window, get into my car door, I mean, get into my garage, they can go in through the back door. <laughs> but my kids never lock the back door. I don't know if I should be saying that here, but <laughs> you know, it's a constant battle. Like, why is the back door unlocked? Oh, I went into the garage to get X, Y, Z. But, you know, we have to do that. We have to pay attention to how, you know, we move on social media and how we interact with strangers. Listen, it's still stranger danger, people, unless you really know the person. And, you know, lock your doors, car doors, your house doors. Just double check before you go to sleep. I'm not going to let my wife watch that last part about locking doors because I am like your teenage kids. I never <laughs> lock doors and it's horrible. And I now after hearing you say that, I think I'm going to start locking my doors. Uh, one, one final note, like, is there anything that you specifically that you would like the public to know? Mm-hmm. Um, I just want the public to know, listen, we are working hard, myself and the command staff, um, even the PBA and the officers, the town manager, the council, listen, we work together to make things better for you. I hope everyone realizes that because, you know, every single complaint that they send on the web, you know, citizens send every single thank you you know, we try to acknowledge that every single cupcake that's brought by the police department, we acknowledge that and we appreciate it. So we're always here. We're always working. Um, you know, I, my assistant tells me I have to learn how to say no. It's hard. <laughs> it's hard because, you know, that one no might have been that opportunity to, you know, sway someone about their opinion of the police department, you know, to, you know, impress that kid to the point where, you know, maybe they want to go into law enforcement or maybe they change their perspective about policing. So I try to make sure I stay out there. I try to make sure I stay engaged with the AG's office, uh, attorney general's office and the prosecutor's office because there are partners. And without those entities, you know, Franklin, our wheels would just stop spinning if we didn't keep our partnerships going. And we're on the move. So 2022, we have a lot of new things coming. Um, we're kicking it off with the body cams and with the surveys, and there will be more. And as the world opens up, you'll see us out there more. I am really a out there at events person. So COVID kind of has me like step back a little bit. And I took it very serious because unfortunately I did get it. So I'm like, 
took two years, but I did, <laughs> you know. Uh, I don't hear you, Malik. Was it this last round? That's when everybody kind of got it. Last round. And, um, you know, my boss will tell you I was really upset about it. <laughs> like, no, I did everything. No, but it, that one was just inevitable. Um, it, and it spread through our department. And I'll tell you this, we didn't miss a beat because what we did was, you know, when we were down 25 officers or so, we just took other officers from different units and they didn't complain. They went to patrol and they helped out wherever they could. So just know that we are here and we care um, about all of the residents, no matter which area you in. Um, during our uh, Facebook um, post yesterday, you know, I heard, I saw, I read some rhetoric about, you know, our officers don't um, patrol here or there. Listen, I look at the map of where our officers are every day. Officers are required to drive through streets and areas. They may not hit an exact street, but they're in that area every single day. Um, Franklin, if you didn't know, is almost 50 square miles. And we have anywhere from six to about 15 cars out at one time during different periods of the day. And that's not including the supervisors and myself who rides around. So listen, we're paying attention. Nothing's perfect. We can't have an officer on every 500 streets in Franklin, but you know, at one time, but we do our best. And I don't know if anyone would want that. I don't know if I would want to see a cop every, <laughs> every single block. <laughs> I think we're living in a military state, you know what I mean? But, but we're here. We're here if you um, need us. Thank you so much for your time, Director. Mm -hmm. Anytime, anytime.